Jesus is Lord. And he was such a nice Jewish boy. <laughs> Jesus changed my life. And he's still in the life-changing business. As Paul said, the love of Christ compels me. You know, Randy, I think most people don't realize how much darkness there is it, in it the world. It can't be just coming to church and getting pumped up with the faith. You and message. I are all going to have to have something of faith in us. Jesus died to save sinners, and you are a sinner. Shalom and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss. We've been in a series talking about prayer and the importance of prayer and all of the different things surrounding that topic. Last time, my dad and I were discussing how we approach God boldly and not arrogantly. How we handle the spiritual warfare side of things with a boldness because we know who we are and we know whose we are. That's an important thing that we always want to keep in mind. This episode, we're going to dive into a little bit more of the nitty gritty on spiritual warfare. And so I don't want to labor on this any longer. Let's dive right into the discussion with my dad and myself in the studio. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Therefore, is it any wonder that the devil resists us as we serve God? Is it a shock that Satan fights tooth and nail to preserve what he sees as his? Of course not. His works haven't yet been destroyed. He's still active in this fallen world. This is why I believe it's time to pray like Watchman Nee suggests. Oh God, your son was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. Please destroy his work in us. Destroy his manipulation over our work. I just want to say, oh, duh, that's so beautiful. That's so correct. It's so profound. But it's so contrary to much of how we conduct ourselves in these spiritual encounters. And, and I want to do better at it. I want to be wiser. And I want to be more humble. And I want to be more effective and more successful. We should be both humble and wise as we engage in such spiritual warfare. This is really important. Jude recorded that even the mighty archangel of God, Michael, didn't assail the devil with reviling accusations of blasphemy or slander. He could have. And any such accusation would have likely been true, but perhaps the strategy of the archangel is worth our consideration. If this lofty, powerful angelic being measured his words, perhaps we should too. Michael didn't say, I'm the demon crusher. I'm the devil stomper. He said, the Lord rebuke you in Jude, the ninth verse. I believe great wisdom and restraint was modeled for our instruction. As Michael limited his words in his battle with Satan, so should we limit our words. Satan is not moved by our spirituality or our experience in such matters. He's not. In fact, apart from the power of God released in his realm, Satan has no natural predator to stop his activities at his level of the food chain. And there's just no point in pretending it's otherwise. But Satan has no choice but to cease and desist at the rebuke of the Lord. So let us not waste our words on Satan. Rather, let us recognize it is only through the rebuke of the Lord in the name of Jesus that we have a strong defense. We might feel like we've got a stern voice. We might feel like we really know how to articulate our words and say, you're a bad person, devil. And uh, we might feel like that's going to be effective. I promise you, if we go through the entire discussion in the Bible and what we've been talking about with my dad, listen, our words are not as powerful as our dad's words. Our Father in Heaven has given us authority, and with that authority, we can speak on His behalf. And what does He say? Well, we go through His Word, and we use His Word as what He says to say. Devil, the Bible says, God says X, Y, Z. And as a result, you have to flee. I encourage you. Think through that in, in this practical sense. We approach the throne room 
and we approach the conversations with the devil with the authority of God because we have his word to lean on. You got to know his word, of course. You got to study his word. You got to know what God says. But that's a powerful thing to, to keep in mind. Let's, let's dive right back in. When the Lord rebuked the natural elements of the horrific storm, the wind and the waves gave way to the command of Jesus. I mean, that's just... Yeah. Everything in heaven and earth must pay attention and obey when the Lord speaks. He speaks with all power and all authority. And as we pray and pursue God's will, the Lord desires to move on our behalf. He yearns to display His mighty power on our behalf to reveal His glory. It's about Him. It's not about us. That's why the t-shirt is really a bad idea. <laughs> I'll cancel the order. Okay. I mean, we should never approach Satan in a cavalier manner or attempt to elevate our spiritual reputation by rebuking Satan or de demanding results because God pours His love and power into our lives. God does pour His love and power into our lives. That doesn't go on the t-shirt either as though we earned it, we deserved it, we had it coming. It's not the way it works. We must not allow ourselves to become confused as to why or how Satan responds to our words. To do so is to proudly walk into a trap. And I don't want to do that and I don't want my loved ones to do that. It's only as we humbly submit ourselves to God that we can yield our will to God and He will bring to pass everything that He desires through our struggle. He knows our struggle. He's allowed us to get into the struggle that we're in. He's not worried. He's not off balance because we're in this circumstance. It's true that demons tremble at the name of Jesus. But our task is not to cause demons to walk around on shaky legs. <laughs> that's, that's not the purpose. It would be a better exercise to learn to master our words. I believe that our tongues can declare the name of Jesus, but our tongues can also spew poison as an unruly evil, cursing what God has not cursed. James gave profound advice about dealing with Satan. The best spiritual stance to take in such a struggle is to humble ourselves before God. Referring back to Proverbs, James said, God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. That's from James chapter 4, verse 6 in the NLT. I want God's favor, and none of us can stand against His opposition. So James instructs, humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. That's James chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. The devil doesn't flee because we are of such a spiritual stature that he fears us. If we truly humble ourselves and draw near to God, Satan doesn't even notice us. When we're in God's presence, he doesn't see us. God's overwhelming. When we are in the presence of God, as we draw near to God, God's power emanates in spite of us, not because of us, in spite of us. And Satan cannot stand in the presence of God. He must flee. So our spiritual battle tactic must begin in humility and stay close to God where His protection brings our victory. So why am I in the struggle that feels unending? and unwinnable, because it feels that way. If I just speak honestly and bluntly, ugly, it feels like I can't win. But I've already, I got that card I made. I won't quit. My father loves me. I work for my father. You can't beat my father. You remember Jesus? The feeling of being in a struggle that's unending and unwilling, 
uh, uh, un, unwinnable. That feeling is an illusion that I've chosen to believe because I moved beyond the protective shadow of God. That's on me. That's not on God. Therefore, if I've allowed Satan to draw me away from my place of protection, I must return to the only place I can stand. And I must humbly ask God to rebuke Satan, as did the Archangel Michael. So this whole issue, this whole topic of prayer and you know rebuking and and how we approach with this uh, this power that we have, if you will, it relies on the baseline, the foundation of humility and submission to God. Listen, we can talk powerfully about what the Bible says, but we still have to be humble in recognizing that the power that we speak with is not our power. It's power that's been, been given to us to use, but it's God's power. It's His authority. It's His, it's His word. It's His strength. It's His almighty, powerful self. And the moment that we get a little bit too confident uh, to the point that it becomes arrogance, or the point that it becomes, um, we, we think it's us. That's when things start falling apart. That's why we've got to always be intentional to make sure that we're resting in His power, in His authority, and not our own. I encourage you to, to keep that in mind. We've got to take a short break. I encourage you, stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to keep going uh, on this important topic, but stay tuned. Uh, grab a drink, uh, find us on social while you're uh, sitting on your couch, but uh, come back after the break and we'll see you in a bit. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Randy Weiss and I only have about 30 seconds to tell you about my brand new book, Pray, Fight, Win. Now, I know what you're thinking, what's the book about? It's about going on the offensive. It's about giving the devil the old one-two with your prayers. But it is so much more than that. It's a journey that we take together to find the deeper meanings within the righteousness of Christ and the treachery of the devil. I hope you'll check it out. Now it's certainly true that our adversary, the devil, seeks our destruction and our damnation. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, deliver us from the evil one. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, the NIV. Deliver us from the evil one. Satan is a malevolent being bent on evil, but our freedom and security is safe in Christ. I agree once again with the wise words of Watchman Nee. He said, since we do not know when the evil one will come to molest us, we ought to pray with this word. Our Lord Jesus, having despoiled the principalities and the powers, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it, in the cross. And Brother Nee continued with advice tailored to my circumstance. He said, whenever we see the devil's power on a rampage, we should stand on the ground of the cross, asking the Lord to put the devil to shame once more. When the devil is shamed, he dare not raise his head. How then can he molest us again? My position is that we can and we should ask God to curse Satan. The Lord is perfectly poised to rebuke Satan and to shame him. The devil fell from heaven because of his pride. That works against him and for us. God alone will shame him and eventually silence every effort of Satan in eternal judgment. And I believe God is exalted as he strips Satan of the power to obstruct God's own work in our lives. So let us draw near to God that Satan will flee and God will free us from every demonic obstruction. Are you getting that? I mean, is that making sense to you? Yeah, so uh, this is all obviously, uh, you know, we're, we're taking a very macro approach to, you know, this parable, of course, of the persistent widow mm -hmm. um, and prayer, right? And we, we, you talk in here about 
resisting the devil and he will flee. So if you go to the James, the James scripture, it is pretty much reiterating what everything you just said there. It says, and of course it also kind of touches base a little bit on the, uh, the devil stomper. What's, what's, what's the shirt that we're going to not get? <laughs> The demon, demon crusher, crusher. De demon crusher, devil stomper. Right. It, it says, uh, it says, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud. So I guess we don't want the shirt, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. So ultimately one of the ways that we resist the devil is by drawing near to God. It absolutely is the best. It's the best approach. Yeah. And, and I, I know this raises questions for those of us who have been enduring, uh, you know, some long, difficult season of what feels like an impossible struggle. Yeah, you, you know, talk to some people and they feel like they're in the never ending right. struggle. And you know, they, it begs obvious questions. You know, how long is this going to go on? Have we not suffered enough? Why do we quietly continue enduring this spiritual onslaught without rising up to stop the enemy assault? And, and I, I am asking that question because I think it's a mistake and I think that we have to rise up. I'm going to return to Watchman Nee. He informs us that we can stop this persecution and we should seek vindication. I've said that several times because we should <laughs> stop this persecution and we should seek vindication. He tells us a simple truth if we're willing to hear it and endure it. The Lord Jesus is calling us today to oppose the devil with prayer. Those are the words of Watchman Nee. The Lord Jesus is calling us today to oppose the devil with with prayer. Now some may ask, okay, let's pray. Well, how long should we pray? When is our prayer finally going to be effective? Jesus gives us that answer. So I want to return to the model of the widow woman in the parable that was the opening subject of this little excursion. Jesus said, quote, we should always pray and never give up. These were the words with which he introduced his parable. Jesus assured us with great specificity the unjust character of the judge who answered the widow's persistent prayer is contrasted with God's good and just character. And Jesus instructed us. This is from Matthew 18, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 18, verses 7 to 8 in the NLT the New Living Translation, God will surely give justice to His chosen people who cry out to Him day and night. Will He keep putting them off? I tell you, He will grant justice to them quickly. That's the answer that Jesus gives in response to that question. And I think we should believe it. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Randy Weiss and I only have about 30 seconds to tell you about my brand new book, Pray, Fight, Win. Now, I know what you're thinking, what's the book about? It's about going on the offensive. It's about giving the devil the old one-two with your prayers. But it is so much more than that. It's a journey that we take together to find the deeper meanings within the righteousness of Christ and the treachery of the devil. I hope you'll check it out. I understand where you're at with this, mm -hmm. and I don't disagree. From a practice standpoint, for myself, I'm I'm very much. There's only so much room in my head, right? So, we are nearing the bursting point in this discussion because you're you're cramming a lot in. Okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to take it all in, right? Mm -hmm. There's only so much room in my head when I'm working through my day to day life whether it be work, whether it be church, whether it be family, I have certain check boxes that are, that are taking place as information is coming to me. Does this matter to me? Is there anything I'm going to do to change this? Or do I just discard it before it goes there, right? So there's, as I'm going along, 
if it's not something that I need to be worrying about, I just kind of put the, okay, thanks for letting me know, but I don't need to actually retain space in my head for this because it's going to take place either way, right? So, so this is, sounds really bad, but like I know that when my wife tells me that there's going to be this activity, whether it's a football game for my son or whatever, it, it goes on my calendar, but I don't retain the space in my head because she's going to remind me six more times, don't forget you've got the, you've got the game for your son, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of a, it's going to happen either way. So with prayer and with the resisting the devil, mm-hmm. how long are we going to be in this difficult time? How long do I have to resist? How long do I have to petition? How long? And I've never really viewed my situation like that because I kind of put a lot of things in the checkbox of it doesn't matter. All things work out for good to them that love the Lord and are called to I know that's a little bit lazy, but that's, that's genuinely how I am much of the time. From a philosophical standpoint, I, I trust that God is good. I believe he's got my best interest in mind. If it seems bad, he already knows it's going to end up good. And so I just have the checkbox of, well, it, it's, I know how it's going to end up, and so it's okay. It might hurt for a while. It might go on for a long time, but it really is irrelevant because I know how that is. That seems a little bit lazy, and based on all that we're going on, it's really irresponsible because we're supposed to be petitioning God. Right. And but like you a, understand the, 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 a, the dilemma. A great boxer once said, yeah, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Okay? Uh, our problem is oftentimes we don't really recognize that our adversary has a plan. If we take that into account, we will have a defense against his strategy and we will deploy an offense, which is what I'm proposing. And it will also change the way we pray. And it will enable us to, I believe, pray with more confidence and when someone pulls out in front of us in traffic or when a curveball comes in our conversations or our negotiations or we're, we're hit with an unexpected obstacle or obstruction, instead of reacting to a person or to a situation, we'll identify this is spiritual. So I, I, I thought about this analogy earlier. I didn't do it because it just seems a little sacrilegious to kind of bring you know, this type of analogy into the discussion. But you opened the door with the boxing. So the door's there. I can bring the analogy in. Okay. Right? You were a Rocky fan. Right? You had I am a Rocky fan. Sorry, you you am a Rocky fan. (laughs) Once a Rocky fan. You you am a Rocky fan. Okay, so... (laughs) So... Wait, isn't everyone? (laughs) So Rocky... Rocky... We know the, the... When the movie starts... The movie's name is Rocky. You know he's going to be the victor. Regardless of what happens throughout the story, you know he's going to be the victor. So Even if, I, if he loses, even, no, no, he's even still, if he loses, it's still the, part the, of his victory. The full story is he's going to win, right? <laughs> we know that's the story. And we know there's going to be a sequel because he's got to continue winning because it's Rocky. So in the analogy of prayer, in the analogy of prayer, I know I'm going to win because I am the Lord's. Right. And... God is good, right? And God has a plan. Yeah, yeah. Because of this card, right? I won't the quit. My card. father loves 2.0. me. I work for my father. You can't beat my father. Do you right. remember Jesus? So, so I know, I know I win, right? And I know that all things work together for my good because I do love the Lord, because I am called according mm-hmm. to his purposes, because I commit my life to him on a daily basis and am constantly working towards that progressive sanctification of drawing closer to him and, and, and becoming more holy as I die to self and he grows in me, right? So, so I know the end of the story of my Rocky match, just to crystallize things, in, in what we're talking about here. It's a matter of how many times I want to get punched in the face before I get to the end of that match. If I petition before the Lord, if I go to the Lord, if I pray, if I, uh, if I don't just take what the enemy throws at me, maybe I can finish it in round two or three instead of having to go the full ten. Thank you. You've been paying attention. Okay. That is my point. There you go. All okay. Right. So, just so you know, there's a few check boxes I just checked off in my head, so it better be really good where we continue to go because I, there's only so much space. I believe we should set ourselves to pray in confidence 
and we won't reach the end without seeing God's mighty deliverance. God will bring His desired victory, and Satan will release his grip on our success. I believe in some cases our success has been held back because of Satan's grip, and it will all lead to the greater glory of God. Now, I don't think that we should be surprised that praying in the daytime and the nighttime is required. I think we must sort of condition our prayer life to become constant. I think that's what it's really saying. We should be constant. We should remain in dialogue. In constant community with the Lord, communion with Yes. God. And I think we can assume that if we're not doing that, we are going to have a problem. And I don't think it's hard to do this. I don't think this is some, you know, death-defying feat that uh, only the super spiritual can enter into. I think it's for all of us. We just have to develop a habit of keeping our minds in tune and talking to God. And it's like it's like your marriage. I mean, I, I, I am in constant dialogue with my wife. Yes, we're not always in the same room together, but we're in constant communion. And when we aren't, it's usually going to create a problem. And and there's 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 a reality here that I forget. And therefore, I'm concerned those who I love may forget. The importance of prayer in our day-to-day lives, it, it can't be overstated. It just, it cannot be overstated. Listen, we all go through difficult times. We all experience hardships in life. And sometimes that's the, that's the most obvious time for us to pray. That's the most that's the easiest time for us to go to God because we're in need, we're desperate. Uh, and so that's, that's, almost, that's almost normal, right? When you're a believer and you're in need, you go to God. But the importance of staying connected to God in your prayer life on an ongoing basis, that, that is key. I, I encourage you to apply that in your day-to-day lives. And that's just what we're gonna talk about in the next episode. We're gonna start talking through, okay, what are some practical approaches on how to apply these concepts and prayer in general in the day-to-day life? At what point do you pray? Do I pray you know, at each step? Do I pray you know, at every single decision? Do I pray you know, to decide where to go eat lunch? Do I pray over, like, we're gonna start talking through a little bit more on the day-to-day activities of prayer and hopefully provide you with a little bit more framework on some uh, guidance on how to pray. So with that, I encourage you, come back next week. In the meantime, I do want you to come and find us online at uh, crosstalk.org. We look forward to chatting with you, hearing from you, uh, maybe testimonies or prayer requests you might have. And uh, until next time, shalom and God bless.